Hi, and welcome to the Org Dev Podcast. So how can you take a systemic approach to well-being in your organization? And what does that look like? And what are some of the challenges with traditional approaches to well-being initiatives? Well, today we're absolutely delighted to be meeting a pioneer who's challenging the way we approach resilience, leadership, and organization culture within organizations. We're delighted to welcome Michael Matania. He's CEO of Mycelium. Now, he doesn't call himself an OD practitioner, but Danny and I have officially named him one, haven't we, Danny? Yeah, we have. Because he sees organizations in a systemic way and not just that, but he really approaches his work and the human condition seeing it in a systemic way as well. So he describes himself as a survivor of PTSD, addiction and psychosis, and he's used that to actually guide the work that he does. Mycelium are an organization that call themselves the Future of Wellbeing Pioneers, and it's a well-earned title. In his previous careers, he's a previous roles co-creating MindKit, the world's biggest peer-led mental resilience program. He established the Workplace Mental Health Champions Professional Network uh, for Time to Change, the UK's biggest national mental health campaign. And he's also worked extensively with organisations across the world, including Google, Facebook, BBC, Sky, British Red Cross and many others. Now, Danny, you actually met Michael in 2018, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah. So it's a, lo- a long while ago. He, he made a, a very generous offer on LinkedIn to come in and deliver a, a lunchtime talk of part of Mental Health Awareness Week, I think. So I reached out to him. He came in, delivered a fantastic talk for the Investors in People team and uh, we've stayed connected ever since. So. You guys, you guys were compelled all the way through, weren't you? Absolutely, yeah. Got such good feedback when he came in; uh, people were just transfixed. Um, so, yeah. Brilliant. So he's dedicated his life to sharing what he's discovered through his recovery with others as well. And not only that, fun fact: he actually plays the banjo too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we'd share that with Michael to see what a rounded person you are as well. Brilliant. Well, welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. So it's lovely to have you with us, Michael. So just to kick off, just tell us a bit about the, your role, what you do and, and what Mycelium does. So at the centre of it, Mycelium helps organisations create cultures of what we call sustainable performance. And we do this through upskilling and reskilling their people. And we do that through primarily talks, workshops, durational programs, and consulting, basically acting as a thinking partner, strategic advisor. And my role within that whole piece tends to revolve around curriculum development. So my life learning and creating our programs, talks, we very, very rarely do things off the shelf. We have a few core models and frameworks that we work with but generally we try and be as responsive to organizations as possible because mycelium as an organism never looks the same way twice it grows to take the shape of whatever environment you drop it into and that's kind of how we work and so for those who don't know what mycelium is mycelium is a it's a subterranean fungus that knits forests together by connecting their root systems And what it does is enables trees to pass each other information and nutrients. And it's basically transforming human understanding of how forests work. And that's essentially what we do. We provide the invisible infrastructure required for individuals and teams to perform through periods of change. Usually what happens during big times of change is that we focus on the visible. We look at the technology, we look at the processes, etc., but actually we're not looking at the things that we can't see. And so it's easy to ignore and we can pretend it's not there. So what we're trying to do is foreground this piece so that we can bring it into awareness of leaders when they're undergoing these periods of change and navigating the uncertainty and the volatility that is inherent to even the most ordinary organizational life. Wow. That's fascinating. And that's, a really interesting way of looking at organizations isn't it and it's a little bit of a challenge to the norm how, how did that come about for you what was that sort of, what was your theory of change how did it come around we arrived at mycelium as a metaphor for a practice of trial and error so the company was initially called tough cookie and we were focused on human resilience and essentially we wanted to understand what does it take to create true human resilience and so we were researching and developing training and consulting around this area and the more you nerd out on this and the more you deep dive into individual resilience the more you actually come up against the limitations of individual resilience because we're intimately bound to the people around us and the systems with which we're embedded in 
And so the more work we were doing with people, we were equipping them with all of these new behaviors and we were supporting them to embed these behaviors and go on these behavior change journeys. But as we examine the scaffolding that's required, it's like no matter what scaffolding you put in around an individual, unless you're looking at the system, unless they're in an environment where they're being supported to embed those new behaviors, it's really hard for them to sustain them in the long term. It's like trying to give up carbs in January and then being at a banquet or a wedding, right? And there's all of these sausage rolls and everything there. It's just much easier to give up carbs when you're at home than when you're at a wedding. It's much easier to give up drink when you're in an environment surrounded by lots of recovered alcoholics enjoying a sober night at a restaurant rather than being at a pub with all of your mates whose bonding rituals revolve around getting drunk just much harder to be sober in that environment. And so for whatever reason, we don't tend to, or organizations don't tend to appreciate the role of the environment in the individual's behavior. There seems to be some kind of a block. And so that's what at Mycelium we're looking to do is to really look at, okay, the individual is incredibly important. The sovereignty of the individual, strengthening the individual in terms of their mindset, their inner capacities in terms of how they manage their thoughts, their emotions, their nervous system, how they design their life, how they design their work, they all of these different pieces. But they don't exist in a neutral nebula. They also are embedded in a relational web. They have the horizontal support, horizontal influences amongst their teammates. They have vertical influences. They have a line manager, etc. So there's all of these different forces acting on this individual. And if we don't honor and include these external forces when examining an individual, then problems that could be solved systemically and relationally through shared team practices, norms, culture, leadership, policy, protocol, procedure, are instead fixated upon, dwelled upon, and endlessly rehashed as these static individual problems. And so what we end up with within, I believe most modern organizations who are governed by what we call legacy workplace culture, which is the culture we've inherited from our ancestors. It was basically dreamed up by Frederick Taylor and his contemporaries during the second industrial revolution. We over-focus on my stress, my anxiety, my burnout. And in that over-focusing, in that siloed thought, I don't pay attention to our stress, our anxiety, our burnout. And so we're not solving these problems that are actually collective, cultural, systemic problems. It's just individuals in silos trying to go it alone. And we see the limitations of that, right? You see burnout is higher now than it was at the height of the pandemic, despite record amounts of investment. So what's happening there? Yeah, there's so many interesting questions there. And, and we'll take a deep dive in, in a few moments, I guess. And, and how do you actually work with organizations? Do you obviously take a systemic approach? Do you work with people as individuals, as groups? Like How, how does it work? always groups generally we might do the odd one-to-one piece as and when required but we'll try as much as as possible steer organizations away from that and towards group-based work because so much of the work that needs to be done can only be done in groups because it's culture and culture exists in relationships it also exists in mindsets and norms and when i say norms i mean norm systems in terms of what behaviors do we punish? What behaviors do we reward? But in terms of how we work, we tend to work through talks, workshops, and programs. And most of our work falls under two buckets. One is performing through change and specifically looking at sustainable performance. And the other is leading through change. So looking at leaders and managers. And within the first, performing through change, we have various programs. We've got one on fundamental resilience, which is looking at okay if you couldn't contact anyone and you couldn't move how would you cope with adversity so it's all about managing thought emotions and nervous system and what best practice actually looks like in that we've got one on mindset which literally means how is your mind set in which position is your mind set and how does that both limit and enhance depending on the mindset um, how you're relating to the world around you. And so we're looking at how do you create adaptive mindsets? And then we also look at what we call performance by design, which is essentially looking at how do I design the different cycles of my life, the day, the week, the month, the season, and the year 
to maximize performance and maximize what we call work-life integration, which is basically an innovation on work-life balance, which obviously views work and life as a zero sum game between the two. And actually that's not something we agree with, but I can come back to that if you like, but on the managers and leaders front, we're looking at how do you lead groups through change? And so within that, the core constituent parts are how do I as a line manager create psychological safety in my team? How do I provide effective support in terms of supporting people to stay well and then responding to them when they're really not okay if things don't go to plan? And then also how do you as a leader make AI work for yourself and your team given the rapidly changing tectonics in that domain? Generally, all of these different topics that I've named, each one we have talks, workshops, and full durational programs on each subject, depending on how deep people want to dive. And I was basically in a wormhole for about a year and a half. I barely spoke to anyone outside of the organization, <laughs> just just in a room covered in post-its and nerding <laughs> out. So, Oh, I love yeah. it. <laughs> Brilliant. And how do you support organisations to make that shift from thinking that well-being is all about the individual and they need to they need to do individual stuff around well-being? How do you help them see a different way of approaching the, the situation? When organisations come to us, most of the time they've already sensed something's askew. They've thrown everything they can for many years, including the kitchen sink, at employee well-being, and they're not moving the dial on the metrics. The needles that they're looking at aren't moving. In fact, they're getting worse. And so generally they come to us from a place of, we've tried all of these things and nothing's worked. Now what? Yeah. And generally, unless an organization's got to that point where they said, now what? And they're not really ready to work with us because the kind of work that we do is not one and done. It's the work that we do really resists the oversimplified mechanistic models of change that's put forward by behaviorist and constructivist paradigms which we can double click on those two things and my beef with them later but we are what we call unapologetic developmentalists we believe that change is messy and hard and happens over time and is sometimes one step back two steps forwards and needs to be stuck with through ordinary living and working and also requires structures and scaffolding and so what we're generally in terms of working with organizations we've been focusing on bringing together a few different practices one is called micro solidarity which is a an approach developed by my friend rich bartlett who really is a innovator in this space and he is was based in new zealand you know lives in italy with his partner Matty and it's essentially a, a philosophy of how you increase the depth and density of relationships and connections within organizations. And there's basically two components to it. One is scale and one is tempo. So scale is this notion that human organisms form different, human groups form different types of organisms at different sizes. And different size groups are good for different things. And small groups that can fit around a dinner table is the best size for transformation because let's say six people you think of the average dinner table six people is about the number that can hold a shared context once you get past six you notice that the dinner table tends to break into two conversations four for example and so it's the number of people who can hold a shared context together easily without governance structures and so this size group is a really great size group in order to do work together in. and that's how we work. We put people into groups of six, which they journey on together. And this brings us to the second piece, which is tempo. So rhythm and ritual explains a huge amount of human behavior. And also, if you're going to be in a group and you're going to be supporting each other to change, you need to have meaningful conversations. Meaningful conversations require emotionally risky dialogue. And emotionally risky dialogue requires psychological safety. And psychological safety requires trust. And trust is something that grows over time. There's actually an equation for working out how trustworthy someone is developed by Harvard, which is credibility, reliability, and empathy divided by self-orientation. And these things grow over time as you journey with each other. And this is why one and dones don't work. You need to come together multiple times, at least three times, but we make people come together six times in their small groups. And obviously when peers come together, You've got all sorts of social dynamics that show up. 
because in order to change, we need environments, as I said, of psychological safety, and that requires intimacy, mutual support, care, um, partnership. But we've been conditioned by legacy corporate culture for separation, competition, hierarchies, domination. And so we have to unlearn some pretty deep patterns. And so we need scaffolding in order to help us do that. And this is where effective thinking environments comes in. This was a, a term first coined by Nancy Klein and um, have a sip of my tea. And it's essentially a way of placing a structure on a group of people whereby the conversation follows a very specific format, it slows the conversation right down and it enables people to do their best thinking. Talking is actually just thinking out loud. It's how most people do their best thinking. And so what we need in order to do our best thinking, we need equality, we need presence, and we need self-regulation. Uh, in the presence of those things, I will do my best thinking. And effective thinking environments creates a scaffolding to enable those three things to be present. And so you're coming together in a group without a facilitator, but because of the particular methodology of effective thinking environments you don't need that facilitator to mitigate the power dynamics so you're not having to deal with the fact that some people are over contributing taking up too much space some people are under contributing and leaning back and not showing up well enough um, and so these two things together can create a huge amount of intimacy in a group and trust and psychological safety so what we find is you know, in our leadership programs you know, i was chatting to someone not long ago who he ran a leadership training and is it Morningstar last year beginning of last year and they're still meeting you know that's the that's the that's the power of these groups of six you know so you'll be in a big cohort together but you'll also be in groups of six um, and we're actually now developing a piece of technology to automate this for us because it, it requires a fair amount of admin work on our side to do it in a scaled way and also on the client side um, if you're doing it on mass you know some of our clients have 100,000 people and so for us, we've just been awarded grant funding by Innovate UK to build a platform to automate this process of breaking entire organizations into groups of six, then going on a journey together. Um, and that being done all by AI in terms of matching just the right people together, just the right combination of personalities and diversity, both in terms of surface diversity and deep diversity and availability and seniority and all of these other pieces that make a group vibe actually feel like it's humming rather than feeling like it's dead. And then that group meeting together in a platform that we have built specifically for emotionally risky dialogue, for psychological safety, for intimacy, death, equality, self-regulation. In the way that Zoom is built for work meetings, this is actually built for micro-solidarity and effective thinking environments. And then there's an AI Kind of quietly listening to everything that's being said and offering reflections and eventually it will be creating and creating the content in real time but our approach to scaling the relational component we've done a lot of thinking about this over the last five years in fact it's taken us five years to even work out what the problem is or even what the question to ask is and we've come down to this is like the reason scaled interventions don't work is because what well, two failure points micro interventions work running workshops running programs they work really well but that's all given to leaders and managers because that's where the organization wants to invest fair enough i do the same right oh. they're the highest leverage people everyone else has e-learning thrown in them and e-learning doesn't work when it comes to well-being mental health culture performance in the way that it does with compliance training for example and the reason for that is firstly it's optimized for cognitive rather than emotional processing it's been basically designed by people who I say on the whole most IT friends I know tend to under index on <laughs> empathy compared to some of my HR friends for example but also it's just a way it's just in the fashion but cognitive processing is inversely correlated with emotional processing and if we're not having shifts at the emotional level then you don't see the changes in well-being and culture it's absolutely essential now, even organizations that are targeting emotional processing, let's say Headspace or Calm, it's still happening in silos. It's me with my app on my own, clicking through my learning, doing my meditation, feeling my feels, but ultimately I'm focusing on my stress, my anxiety, my burnout, and my conversation is never reaching our stress, our anxiety, our burnout, as I said before. 
And so what we need is technology that both enables emotional processing and requires and breaks down the silos because so much of burnout and behavior change requires accountability. That requires human relationship. Accountability means being able to give an account to tell the story of what happened. And this is what we're trying to automate. And this is what, thankfully, the British government has given us a few bob to make it happen. So let's see. One of the things that's sort of sticking out for me is just how much you're disturbing the system when you're doing these things. So again, my understanding is like it's kind of disturbing patterns of behavior, patterns of interrelating, patterns of feeling, patterns of thinking. What, what does that do when you start to do at scale in an organization? One of the things we say to champions within an organization, champions is our name for people who have a vision for a new way of doing things and are willing to stick their neck out to make it happen or entrepreneurs. And the first thing we say is like, look, you have to be willing to ruffle feathers. And if you're not ruffling any feathers, you're not really doing the job because the status quo, there are many people who really benefit and have done really well within the status quo. And for them, the fact that Deloitte, the latest Deloitte study has seen 51% of people experiencing at least one clinical burnout symptom at any given moment. Doesn't really, for them, it's like, oh, get on with it. Stop complaining. And part of this is because at the upper levels of the organization, I don't know if you work with the Insights Leadership Colors much, the red, yellow, green, blue. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe for listeners, Barry, I'll give you the fag packet description of it. Basically, everyone has four different energies within them and each energy has a color assigned to it so blue is about precision detail questioning thoroughness yellow is about fun creativity novelty imagination green is about feelings inclusion balance and red is about power accountability drive etc and at higher levels of the organization especially bands eight and above you tend to see a massive overrepresentation of red energy. And the thing is, is that red energy on the whole actually gets quite triggered by green energy because a lot of well-being and culture change comes from green. It's like, we want people to have more work-life balance. Let's, let's gather more perspectives and have diversity and let's include more people. And, and actually a lot of people who are very high in red energy, I'm not triggering. It's like, oh, it's a little eye roll. Pull your sleeves up, get on with it. I had to because they've made incredible sacrifices to get to where they are. And so those are the people who are guarding all of the doors and holding all of the keys. And so you need to speak in their language and you need to get them on board because they're the ones who are the budget holders. Ultimately, you know, a lot of these budgets for culture and well-being and d and I, a pity, a pity. You could have an organization that's a multi-billion dollar organization and their well-being budget might be 100K. And so it's like, you need to change the parameters of the conversation. That requires a champion to be prepared to play the game of power internally. It's very much a political thing and it requires strategic thinking. It's like a very long game of chess where every move happens maybe once a week and you're slowly building stakeholder, what we call complicated alliances across the organization. And really, that's a lot of what we do is coaching our champion to think bigger and bolder and being ready to tolerate the discomfort inherent in experiencing the disapproval of people who are wedded to legacy corporate culture. But legacy corporate culture has to be evolved. It's given us many incredible things. It really has, actually, in terms of the technologies that we have, the level of performance that it can create. But what we're seeing now in the internet age is that legacy corporate culture, it's not as fit for purpose as it was before. It needs an iteration and an evolution, and, but it is resisted. And so that pattern has to be worked with throughout all levels of the organization too. You know, we call it the folded arm brigade. Why is it that only one in three men, for example, engage with any workplace wellbeing initiatives? Because often wellbeing initiatives are being couched in the language of green. <laughs> if we're using the insights colors, yeah. whereas actually they are deep in red, for example. And so I'm using very broad brush strokes here. Um, and so the language that we're using aren't speaking to the particular considerations and concerns of red. 
is why I like the language of the increasing use of the language of performance within well-being, moving it from like fluff and self-care, as it's seen through the eyes of legacy corporate culture, into the world of no, actually, if you look at the science, the organizations who are going to outperform the others are the ones that get this right. They will just simply attract and retain the talent. And ultimately, that is the great piece that is required is we need to attract and retain the right talent. And if you don't get this right, it's like, see you later, 10 years time, you're out. And you've made the change between, made the connection between sort of change and well-being. And, and a lot of organizations, for some whatever reason known to them don't make the connection between change and well-being how, how does that play how do you help organizations get an understanding of how those two things are connected and how you need to integrate ch- uh, well-being into the whole change program i mean it comes down to neurobiology the what happens one of the most stressful things you can do to a human being is subject them to too much change too quickly with future shock and so what happens when you're under stress is that your working memory depletes you lose your capacity for perspective taking. And that sits at the heart of creative problem solving and innovation. And so what's required in that instance is you need to reduce the amount of cortisol and adrenaline in the system so that you're then capable of divergent thinking. And within change management, the things you need to do is take people out of silos. You need to make them open to change. They need the right mindset. When people are stressed and overwhelmed, even low level burnout, even the very lowest level, it's like, good luck. Like, they're so much more resistant to new ways of doing things. So really, it's uh, for us, that's a big piece, is neurobiology. And I can go into the neurobiology of the nervous system, but that would take some time to unpack. But that's, I suppose, the first piece. And the second piece is the team that sees reality most clearly is the team that wins. That was a line by the former chairman of GE, whose name evades me. But they're one of our clients, and I remember seeing it, and I was like, God, that's so spot on. And psychological safety, which falls within the bucket of well-being, is what enables teams to see reality clearly. In a fast-changing environment, collective sense-making is absolutely essential. All perspectives. It's like who gathers the most perspectives wins, right? So we need to gather lots of perspectives and there's multiple levels to that. Firstly, I need to share if I'm not okay, because that actually, what happens is that we're often in a prisoner's dilemma when it comes to change. Something gets changed. I did it once in my company. Uh, we did it. We made a change uh, to a team and it was a ne- it negatively impacted them. And um, they didn't tell us for months because they were quite new members of staff and I just assume because I've got this open door and I talk about psychological safety and I try and be vulnerable and role model that, that they would just come forward and tell us if there's a problem and they didn't. And it was a real moment for me of like, oh yeah, of course, people are carrying decades of conditioned responses from legacy corporate culture. So I can be as open as I like, but if I'm not creating the right structures for these people to come forward, I can't just rely on them putting a meeting in my diary and telling me I need to actually put scaffolding in there for them. And so what happens is that if I'm, someone makes a tweak in a change management process, I struggle with that, but I don't tell anyone. My colleague also struggles. They don't tell anyone. And maybe uh, I tell my boss that I'm struggling, but my colleague doesn't. And I'm the one who looks like I'm not really performing. And they're the one who looks like they've got their shit together. And in that instance, maybe they advance because of me. So we're in a prisoner's dilemma because if I reveal and they don't, I'm advantaged. And if they reveal and I don't, then they're advantaged. And basically we're incentivized not to reveal, to to conceal rather than reveal. In our work with organizations, we tend to find 70%, 60 to 70% of people conceal burnout or difficulty from their line manager. So line managers are flying blind often. They haven't got the right instruments to tell them how the change management process is going. And so what is required is psychological safety in order for people to name when things aren't okay. But that's hard because that's the highest level of psychological safety. It's one thing, the lowest level of psychological safety is feeling like all parts of me are welcome. Yeah, that if I'm having a bad day, that that mood is okay. I don't have to put on my smile. Yeah. The next layer is that I can give my peers feedback and tell them when they piss me off. But the highest level is I can challenge the status quo and I can tell my superiors, quote unquote, 
that something isn't cool. And if I can't do that, then they're flying by. And that's why most CEOs think that well-being in their organization is improving this is the latest Deloitte survey. Well, just at the end of 2023, when actually it's decreasing because they're insulated. So they're making these changes and they're not actually getting accurate data because they haven't streamlined psychological safety vertically throughout the organization. So this is another reason why well-being is so important because you need accurate dashboards and you need to understand uh, where people are struggling, where tension points are arising, and therefore what soft skills development might be required or what alterations to processes might be required. And that's why psychological safety is so important. And so there's two things. There's a stress management component and there's a psychological safety piece. Peace. One question we always like to people ask people on the podcast is, how did you get to this point? What was your journey to this kind of this type of work? My own recovery journey brought me to the issue of mental health. And I had a psychosis in my late teens, which was a crescendo of a life of abandonment um, by my father, which was unprocessed, an overstretched mother who did her damn best, but she really just had the had the world stacked against her, you know, having to, you know, go off being a single mum working nine to five and doing childcare on your own. Jesus, I could not do that. Like, I, literally, I, I doth my cat at single mothers all over the place. My mum did her damn best, but anyone in that situation was going to really struggle to meet every need of their kid. And unfortunately, um, those unmet needs in me led me to get led astray for a period of time and got into the world of South London honour culture, basically rude boy culture and um, skunk and drugs. And anyway, a lot of unprocessed trauma, combine that with skunk, ultimately culminated in a psychosis. And my recovery from psychosis was a long road. And it was a road that brought me into contact with all sorts of people who I never otherwise would have met, different therapists and mentors and wisdom keepers of different kinds and like me, they had had an unusual path up the mountain. They'd had their own dark night of the soul. They'd found their way out and they were guiding others. And for me, they helped me to understand what had happened in my mind to lead to my psychosis. One of them in particular really helped me understand what had happened in my family dynamics to lead to my psychosis. My well, therapist, Tash, was with her for five years. And eventually, one of them, Robert Mitchell, helped me understand what had happened in my culture to lead to my psychosis. And so I took everything that I learned and I basically decided to dedicate my life to sharing it with as many people as possible. And so I joined the National Mental Health Charity, Mind, and joined in frontline services in South London and was focused very much on prevention. How do we prevent people from reaching crisis point? So we were focusing on like well-being, mindfulness, resilience, and made a name for myself and you know, found my way into national strategy. And that journey through my mind was like a family for me it was a raft through which I learned my trade the beginnings of my trade um, and then I went down to part-time and then I became the meditation teacher at Facebook and taught there for three years that was such a sweet gig I tell you but <laughs> taught one lunchtime one Wednesday no Tuesday Wednesday Thursday lunchtime and then we just like swan around Facebook with barefoot <laughs> eating food and drinking alcohol it's like so facebook and then this center for young men in gangs and i was really trying to develop practices that both tech nerds and rude boys could relate to in a way that was kind of universal and accessible because so much mindfulness and meditation was being taught in a very therapeutic way mindfulness based stress reduction which is a it was designed for therapists and patients it's not designed for workplaces and but ultimately it's been a victim of its own success because it hasn't innovated because it has to stay the same because it's got this massive evidence base. And so if every, if every, if all you've got is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. And I, I say that with the fullest respect to an MBS, I've done the program and I'll rate it, but just, that's my one critique maybe. But yeah, develop mixed mental arts, taught a load of people in my living room, how to teach it. They went out and taught it. We came back, we iterated it and we kind of it entered the market. And um, it did well. We won awards. We won the Product Impact Award twice. Actually, that's a lie. We didn't win. We came highly commended. One of the judges reached out and just like, just so you know, you are my favorite. But anyway, Lou <laughs> coming second twice is, it was a burn, but highly commended. I suppose it still counts as 
I don't know if that counts as winning an award, but was the beginning of the journey was mixed mental arts, inner capacities. That's what we were teaching. How do I manage my thoughts and my emotions and my nervous system when the shit's hitting the fan? And um, my journey has evolved over time. And, and we were doing therapy with my mom and, uh, and deepening into my understanding, I think, of, of legacy corporate culture. My mom had really been working in some pretty full on organizations and the desert of connection, some of these organizations. And obviously we work with hundreds of organizations so we can feel the culture. It's palpable. People talk about culture, but most, most people actually aren't privileged enough to really understand what it is because they don't visit enough organizations. And you walk in and it's just this atmosphere. Mm. It's the, the facial expressions. It's how they are on a Zoom call. Like, so there are some organizations we've worked with where it's like, God, it feels like you're, you're engaging with a distortion field such as the distress. And these are the people who care the most about well-being. And so, yeah, for me, over time, especially with myself, realizing, you know, as a founder on the startup journey over the last five years, I've come close to burnout several times. And that's with all of the practices at my disposal. And, you know, I realized that you know, my psychosis was really about fixing myself, quote unquote, whereas I realized now it's much more about parenting yourself wisely. And that's a journey that I'm still on. And, uh, for me, it's a journey that can't be done alone. That's what I've realized is uh, I need the people around me. And if I need the people around me, other people do too, because what is most personal is most universal. Like we're tribal primates and we're evolved neurologically to be intimately bound to each other. And yet legacy corporate culture tells us that we need to have, have our shit together on our own. All you see that in all the movies and it's our neurobiology says something completely different. Anyway, that's my very long response to how did I get into this work <laughs> or this approach to this work. If you think about everything you do, what, what is it that drives you? What do you find most fulfilling about the work that you do? To be honest, for me, it's in terms of fulfillment, it's either having, being on a group call with, or watching a recording of like one of our facilitators on a group call with an organisation and they would have come back from breakout rooms and they're having a harvest as a whole group. And basically someone has a meltdown on the call and the thing that's never been named in the organization that everyone knows, but it's never been named comes out. And then our trainer like coaches them through the moment and you can feel the culture shifting in real time. It's electric, these moments. And obviously it's very high risk, these moments. And that's why you need artful facilitation of, and someone who can hold it who has real depth and by depth we mean someone who has an intimate embodied relationship not just with professional expertise but with tragedy and beauty and mystery and you can feel that so they can meet people when they're in a very dire place so that's really powerful and also though to be honest i think the most rewarding thing for me is uh now, I grew up on a progress estate in South East London and uh, grew up working class, poor, single mum. And sometimes we find ourselves, and my head of strategic partnerships for Lau, um, we work very closely together. He does all of our, he's way more um, detail oriented than me. And so for these big partnerships where in order to understand the pain of an organisation, you have to go very deep and very detailed to really get at what's the thing beneath the thing. Um, so we'll be on a lot of calls together. And sometimes we'll be having calls with people who are responsible for, yeah, hundreds of thousands of individuals. And it just feels like very um, high impact and like high octane spaces. And then but you really feel your own power and influence. And that could be really potent to experience. And then we'll come off the call and he comes from a similar background to me and we'll just have this like quite hilarious banter back and forth. Like, I can't believe, I can't really believe we're in these conversations to be honest. And we'll just, yeah, the way we talk to each other is how we would have spoken to each other back in our sort of more rude boy days. So it's quite funny. You get my much more like polished university uh, middle class voice, whereas like <laughs> the, yeah, he, he, he and a few others get a very different side of me. And um, yeah, that that's super rewarding. And also the, Going on a journey with a champion, this is one thing we realized over the five years is that actually it's all about the champion. It's the person, you know, when I think about, say, Craig and Sky, 
who's just they're they're like one of my personal favorites in terms of clients. And I met Craig when he was working in operations, and he was a he'd shared his own mental health story on a podcast in Sky. And as a result of doing that, to do to go first and do that in an organization is a big thing. And um, he found himself in this volunteer role running the Body Mind Network at Sky, and then slowly it's just like watching his journey through the organization widen his like his sphere of influence and power and potency and his like sense of what's possible and being a part of that journey and being able to collaborate with him because you know champions and external providers need each other external providers need people who have high levels of context and have their finger on the pulse of the average person in the organization and they need someone who isn't in the context day in day out who can ask them questions who wouldn't have thought of asking themselves and it's these beautiful journeys that you go on with these individuals where they become more like friendships and come in the camaraderie of working through a tough problem together. Um, yeah, for me, relationships, long-term relationships with champions in organizations is probably the deepest, most rewarding thing. Incredibly interesting, that journey that you go on. Because I, I think people underestimate the word transformation. It gets banded around, doesn't it? But it is sort of true transformation. When you're doing this work, what, what challenges do you encounter? What, what's the tough stuff? One of the big things that is hard to work with is, um, again, legacy corporate culture instills within us and mindset that we call in mycelium the what's the thing mentality. What's the thing? Just give me the thing. Let's just put half an hour in. Tell, tell my people how to be happy and then we're good. And... Um, and if you accept the premise, it's like the what's the thing mentality is part of the problem. So it's like you, you almost have to reject the premise entirely of the request. Of like, yeah, we want, we want um, half an hour for you to do this thing. And it's like, yeah, we can come and do that. Sure. Just so you know, um, people will, will come together. They'll feel great. Maybe even some of them might change a behavior or two, but it's not going to have the impact that you believe that it's going to have, but it will have a positive impact. Um, that's one thing is the what's the thing mentality and how you work with that because change you need to slow people down first one of the reasons people don't slow down is because when you slow down you have to feel all of the submerged content comes up and that's why many of us would rather drown ourselves out with content on our phones uh, rather than experience our own thoughts and feelings and because that's what happens when you have to slow down. So yeah, it's part of it is that. And people are, people are rightly, and well, not rightly, well, yeah, rightly afraid of slowing down. They spend their lives avoiding it. And um, you have to hold them through that very delicately. And that's, that's a challenge. It's how do you slow people down who really don't want to slow down? You know, particularly at senior level, there's a lot of suppression of feeling, a lot of suppression of anxiety, yeah. and often retrofitted with logic. Oh, I did that because da, 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 yeah. you're like, hang on. <laughs> yeah. That was yeah. a knee jerk reflex because you were angry or you were frustrated or you were anxious, whatever it was. And and so sometimes people don't think that emotions and things like that should be discussed in the workplace. We're here to do work. Like, mm. is, is that one of sort of the, the challenges you have to overcome or is that kind of contracted up front? Yeah, I mean, we're always like for us, the great, um, the, the great challenge of our time is, ha- is getting, again, to return to the insights leadership colors, is getting the people who are really over indexed on red on board because they are overrepresented at very senior levels and they need to understand the business case. And so it's really helping those people understand the business case, really allaying their fears because you know, discernment is really highly prized by these people and they've got strong bullshit detectors. And unfortunately, there is a lot of bullshit out there. There's a lot of vanilla garbage and a lot of well-being washing and a lot of like hyperbole of like we're going to come in and we're going to run this in 45 days. This with this is going to transform your organization. And there isn't enough sobriety. And so, you know, the thing is with people who over-index in red at high levels of an organization, it, it one of their coping strategies we tend to find as a pattern is to, to, to succeed within legacy corporate culture, you often have to hide and suppress your vulnerability. And what happens if you do that is that you also start to suppress the vulnerability in others. It starts to elicit a disgust response because, and it is disgust, I believe, is the right emotion. Like we, so we'll, we'll, we'll try and we'll either attack vulnerability in other people in the same that we do, we do in ourselves. 
and I get, I get how you get that way. It's like the sacrifices you have to make to to, to achieve a very high levels in your organization. I get it. I've got way more red since I became a founder. I used to be all green, yellow, <laughs> and then I've had to like over index red in order to push the organization along. And I also, I, I really get the. Um, I've had to work on my own you know, running a well-being company, and then people wanting to take time off for self-care when I was really under pressure to get a project over the line and it elicited disgust and anger. And so, and it's like, whoa, <laughs> Michael, you're running a well-being company at the time, you know. That's such rich material for the work though, isn't it? When you're in that, when you're in the seat and the pressure's on, isn't it? It's how do you stay ethical? How do you stay moral? And how okay. do you, 100%, but that's the real test, isn't it? So it gives you an amazing amount of empathy, I imagine, as well. Uh, just one question I wanted to ask, and Danny, we've got loads of questions we want to get through. There was just that sort of link you're making. You talked about performance by design and the whole act of being intentional and really getting into the way in which people organize themselves and the habits and the rituals and all that kind of stuff as well. That That's a really nice way of thinking about things. How, how does that work in practice? We're cyclical beings. And we're, most of what we do is cyclical. We're involved in different circles of different kinds and cycles, of different kinds, everything from menstrual cycle, the moon cycle, the solar cycle, the, all of these different cycles, even down to ultradian cycles, which are 90 minute cycles, roughly, that our attention and alertness is grounded in. And we need to learn to recognize ourselves as cyclical and to design our activity into that so that we can ride our cycles, our natural cycles, rather than resist them. And so performance by design is basically views our, views a lot of burnout and poor mental health as a design issue, not just organizational design, but life design. Many of us have never thought about how we intentionally design our life and iterate our life in that way some of us do but for us what we did is we looked at the different cycles we looked at okay within a 24-hour cycle what does the science of well-being resilience and performance have to say about what activities should be happening and when in terms of performance priming in terms of actually activating and in terms of deactivating and decelerating in the evening coming back into relationality with my family so i'm not trapped in an always on mentality where I can't be present with my kids. And then looking at, okay, within the week, what activities and rhythms are required? What are my non-negotiables? Yeah, for me, it might be a non-negotiable that's been a big one for me has been a Thursday evening play day with my partner's son, Zef, where it's a way that we, we basically inverse the roles. He gets to decide what we do. And we do child-led play for 90 minutes after work. And I'm either, he either wants me to be basically a monster or some kind of wise sensei, which is really interesting to think about the psyche of a child, because that's probably the two states that he probably sees me through, you know, depending on how rude he's being to his mum. And so it's <laughs> the, yeah, for me, as someone who's struggled in the, in the role of a set parent type role, um, that's really important in order to maintain a buffer that can absorb those, that can absorb the inevitable shocks that come with even the most peaceful family life, you know? And so some things only have to happen once a week to help you feel good and function well. Even just having a date night with your partner. Some, you know, we don't tend to think of what's happening outside of work as factoring into work. But, you know, if I'm on a stool with four legs, work, health, home, and friendship, and my work leg is stable, but all three others are wobbling. I'm going to find it very hard to do a good job in this podcast. I'm going to be focusing on trying to stay stable. And so I know when my relationship is wobbling, my productivity that day feels it. If I get that message on WhatsApp first thing in the morning, we need to talk. It's like, good luck being present with a piece of design that I have to do that day. Work and life, which I believe is a full synergy, weave into each other. Um, but for us, it's basically, okay, how do you take those four areas, work, health, friendship, uh, and home, but also a deeper, more meaningful life also requires us to look at other aspects which provide meaning, such as healing or inspiration and 
connection, or what the ancient Greeks called ecstasis, catharsis, and communitas, and how you weave those into your life at opportune moments, because this is something J.D. Will talks about, and most of the time, we're like, we're feast or famine when it comes to um, designing our life. You know, we go too focused on work, and then we realize our lives become dull and our circle of friends is shrunk because we're ghosting people. And then we kind of take the foot off the gas at work because we're exhausted and then try and focus on other things. And then our professional identity starts to suffer and our team feels it. And it's like, rather than feast or famine, how do we keep things on the simmer? And that's what real intentional life design looks like. So it's looking at my week, it's looking at my month, what are the things I do once a month in order to feel good and function well? What are the things I do once a season? What are the things I do once a year? And helping people to understand how to leverage what are the highest leverage things because not all activities are born equal that's what i mean by design it's looking at these different cycles and designing in and actually entering it into our calendar so important because we're so good at scheduling things when it's our work or it's our kids athletics but we're not good at scheduling the things that help us feel good and come alive so if you look back at everything you've learned, what would you say the most significant lesson or lessons are that you've learned so far? Uh, you know, as someone who started off as a green yellow, <laughs> I wish I'd hired a red blue when I first started. Um, I would save myself a whole load of trouble, I think. You know, thinking about neurodiversity in teams and how you optimize for that neurodiversity. Neurodiversity that is there for a reason. It's how tribes perform. Not everyone needs to be the same. Um yeah, the highest performing teams, as far as I'm concerned, is a red, a blue and a yellow being led by someone who's high in green. And obviously I'm really simplifying. Everyone has all of the colours, but you know what I mean. Um, emotional processing and relationship have to be honoured and included in any intervention. That performance and well-being are not mutually exclusive. They need each other. That there are some business decisions that can only be reached by going into wild nature for a week with your phone off. There's some pieces of strategy or innovations that only come on mountains or by rivers or in forests. And that for me has been a great source of inspiration and direction. Maybe finally, the greatest thing I've learned is um, how much power um, my um, partner wields over the fate of my organization because so many bad business decisions I have avoided by a really well-timed piece of pillow talk where she's given me just a strategic nugget or a question that's reframed everything or she's given me a piece of feedback that maybe someone in my team might not feel comfortable giving me but she's just willing to bring it and I think actually having friendships, talking to your friends about your business and asking them for their advice from your friends who knew you before you had the armor of your job title, before I was a CEO, those are the people who are most likely to tell you as it is and not sugarcoat it. And you can do as much psychological safety work in your organization as you like. And sometimes there will still be things that a friend is really well placed to deliver. Friends and partners are often the unsung heroes of organisations, aren't they, in terms of providing this ability, just another context, whatever it is, but just to give yeah. people more to them than just the work as well. well. I just want to say a huge thank you, Michael. It's been just a, a really enjoyable conversation. Really enjoyed the way you've sort of taken all of our questions and just answered them with a real sort of thoughtfulness and depth and, and real precision as well. So thank you. Um, there's there's loads of takeaways that I'm taking from it. I'm sure you have as well, Danny. Oh, there's loads of good phrases I've got. I've got uh, the team that sees reality uh, most clearly wins. What is most personal is most universal, which I love. Uh, change is messy and hard and takes time. I think sometimes we forget that, don't we? Um, sorry, Danny, I'm still in all the good ones here. I'll go for it. <laughs> And performance and well-being aren't mutually exclusive as well. And I just, I guess the other thing is just, just the intention, intentionality of designing, how we just don't spend enough time thinking, we're always doing, and, and, and the importance of that, whether we're applying it in how we work, how we uh, resource ourselves, whatever. How about you, Danny? Yeah, I'd echo all of that. And I think a few other things I'm taking away, the, the comment you made about the people needing scaffolding to be able to speak openly, that you can't just kind of say, you can talk openly, you know, trust me, come to me. People need scaffolding to be able to do that. 
I think the importance of weaving performance language into the wellbeing dialogue and how that's really important in terms of getting our messages and creating change. I love the phrase, um, some organisations like deserts of connection. It's such a strong, strong phrase and a strong metaphor and you feel it, I think you can feel it when you walk into organisations that just that, that felt sense that, you know, people aren't talking, even if they, they're not connecting, even if they're talking. And then the, the, the importance of getting rid of the, what's the thing mentality, that kind of, temp, come on, do it in half an hour, do your thing in half an hour. Well, well thank you so much, Michael. If, if people want to follow your work, if they want to, a lot of people will be compelled by the things that you're saying. What, if they want to reach out to you, what's the best way for people to do that? They can reach out on LinkedIn, Michael Matania, or they can go to myceliumgroup.co and drop us a message and we can hop on a call or a member of my team can reach out and if that fails they can strap a letter to a pigeon and, and, that, <laughs> and let them through <laughs> the pigeon will know where to find me okay we'll, we'll get on that as well <laughs> brilliant well thank you so much michael really appreciate your time and, and thank, thank you. you we've really enjoyed it thank you thank you so much to you both for some really thoughtful questions and um yeah, you can tell so much about the quality of questions that people ask you. So, yeah, my sense is that uh, you both really are on a quest to figure out how do we do this thing, <laughs> these humans working. So, yes, may may you keep asking great questions. And if you figure that out before we do, then t- just send the, pi- send the pigeon. Send the pigeon over, okay? <laughs> Roger that, Echo One. <laughs> Thanks. Cool.